So welcome everyone, wherever you are, whatever time it is of day, we're very pleased that you are joining us live or perhaps listening to this as a recording at a later date. My name is Joanna Wedge and I work for UNICEF as one of the two co-leads of the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group, which is one of the four working groups of the Global Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. So it's a real pleasure for me to have brought together this super panel that you're going to uh, be learning from and learning with over the next hour. Um, as we look at prevention of harm to children in humanitarian settings, particularly focusing in on uh, primary prevention, and then also looking at some of the linkages to the CPMS, which I'm sure many of you are aware of and, and are also using in your actual practice. So I just wanted to take a moment to um, go through the agenda with you so that you know um, how we'll be spending our time. Um, we're going to open up um, with our first panelist, Henny Mansourian, who's one of the um, coordinators of the Global Alliance and one of the driving forces of our prevention initiative. Um, and he'll be taking us through an introduction to prevention um, and zeroing in, as I said, on, on primary prevention. We have a little activity to do before that. Um, and then we're, it's a little quiz and we'll see how you do kind of before, um, before the presentation and then also kind of what learning you've done, whether, whether your answers are indeed correct afterwards. Then we're going to turn to some examples of the different work that we do. Uh, we have with us Sarah Uppard, who is one of the consultants who's been leading on developing guidance around the prevention of family separation. So she'll give you that uh, little insight into that forthcoming guidance and, um, and some examples. She'll be followed by Sylvia Onyate, who is um, one of the co-leads of our Child Labor Task Force. So we'll be diving into issues around the prevention of uh, children's labor in humanitarian settings. Um, and then we have a final uh, panelist who um, is Paula Vargas, who is joining us from Timor-Leste where she is a UNICEF's child protection specialist. And she's going to be looking at how they concretely use the primary prevention framework that's been developed by the Alliance in their latest um, uh, disaster that, that hit the island. So giving you a, a real kind of country operations. Throughout, there'll be a time to ask questions. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat box um, or to raise your hand um, and we'll acknowledge you and, and bring you in. Um, just towards the end of the uh, hour, we will be doing a, a little exercise with you about looking at how feasible is it for you to be doing primary prevention in your context. Um, so looking at uh, what impact you would have if you do it and how um, realistic or feasible is it to do. So you can, um, Honey will take us through a tool that will help you look at where your efforts uh, would produce the most results. And then we'll close out with some resources um, and uh, some ideas for, for going forward as we continue on with our prevention initiative. Katie, could you pop into uh, the chat box the uh, Menti that we're going to use? So if you click, if everybody can click on that Mentimeter um, and you'll come up with two questions. Um, and we want to know if it's which level of prevention. We have three levels of prevention, as some of you may already know. We have primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary, or first, second, and third. So there's a question there about this particular activity that we undertake as child protection workers in a humanitarian setting. What level do you think it would, um, it would fit into? Oh, beautiful. Lots of votes coming in. So no one thinks it's secondary. It's either primary or tertiary. Okay. We go to the second slide um, that you've also voted on that one. Couple of people only. Social norms and behavior change interventions such as programming to reduce violence in schools, including positive discipline, anti-bullying, and so on. Most of you think it's a primary level intervention. Uh, one person thinks it's a secondary level and uh, a couple of people, and then someone thinks it's a tertiary level. All right, so I'm not gonna give you the answers just yet got a nice um, split across, seven at primary, three at secondary, and one at tertiary. Um, so we will come back to that and um, help you kind of work through what, um, what answers are actually, what that answer actually was. 
But right now I'm going to pass the floor over um, to my colleague, Hani Monsoria, um, and he is going to lead us through kind of an introduction to prevention and a look at the primary prevention framework. Over to you, Hani. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you hear me okay. Um, thanks for joining. Um, and thanks, Joanna, for being the force behind organizing this uh, and everyone else who is going to be supporting. Yes, yeah, so as uh, Joanna indicated, I'll, I'll walk you through what, what we mean by, by prevention. Uh, but I want to give a little bit of a background as well. We started working on this topic of, of prevention with a focus on primary prevention about uh, four years ago when our previous strategy was, was launched with uh, prevention as being one of the secondary priorities for, for that strategy. And then the current strategy, which was launched uh, last year, uh, has prevention as one of its primary priorities. Um, and quite a bit of work has, has been done um, on prevention and we'll mention some of them. Um, but I just, just to kind of get, give a sense of what we mean by primary prevention to make sure that we are all on the same page as we start this discussion, uh, I just wanted to show you the, the famous um, pyramid of prevention. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this pyramid uh, is basically um, the, the concept, not the pyramid itself, but the concept is borrowed from public health. So from the health sector. Uh, so public health for many, many decades has been doing uh, what, what we, we now uh, term primary prevention. Um, and a lot of the examples of that um, we are all familiar with are things like higher taxes on cigarettes or um, higher taxes on alcohol to reduce consumption of, of alcohol or, or cigarettes, which has, has health uh, benefits for, for the population, but it's done at the population level. Or um, almost all of us who are on this call hopefully wear our uh, seat belts when we sit on, in our cars. And that's a very clear pr primary prevention intervention that the public health sector has done a few decades ago um, and basically forced uh, this to become law in many countries and then forced a lot of uh, car companies to, to produce cars with seat belts to make sure that uh, we have less injuries uh, from that. So these are just very simple examples from what, where we have borrowed some of our terminology, some of our concepts. So primary prevention for us in child protection means addressing some of the root causes that leads to child protection harm. So typically what we do very well in child protection is when children are separated from their parents, we, we try to identify them and put them through the FTR process and hopefully reunify them and reintegrate them them into their families. If children are already in child labor, we, we do pretty well in kind of trying to support them and bring them out of child labor and integrate them back into school and, um, and their families. Um, what we have done less of is seeing how we can identify what causes children to go into child labor, what causes children to be separated, um, and then try to address those. And and part of the problem that we'll discuss later is that it's, it goes beyond child protection, it becomes a multi-sectoral um, endeavor. So that's primary prevention. It's, and it's very important to, to recognize that it's done at the population level. It doesn't mean that it's the entire population of a country uh, necessarily, but it's not about individuals. It's about addressing those, uh, addressing those risk and protective factors at a large scale with, with a group of either children or families or communities. Um, and it's, it's not picking a child out because that child is particularly vulnerable or has been harmed. Secondary prevention then goes to the level of the child. Um, it's when a child is at high risk of harm. So a, a particular child that gets identified as being at high risk of being separated or being going into being recruited into armed forces or groups, then we do certain interventions for that particular child to make sure that that child does not end up in child labor or in, in armed forces and groups. Uh, so that's secondary prevention, So it's but it's again before the harm has actually happened. 
tertiary prevention gets very close to what we typically call response or remedial action, which is once the harm has already been done, it's again about a, a, an individual child uh, that is identified as have already been harmed. So the child is already separated. The child already, is already recruited into armed forces or groups. And we identify that child and we make sure while we respond, which is our kind of most common intervention through, our, through case management or through other programs, we also make sure that this child is not harmed again in the, in the future. So we, we try to limit the recurrence of, of harm to, to the child and also limit the impact of the harm that has already taken place. So if the child has already been recruited uh, by trying to demobilize the child and reintegrate them into, into their society, into their communities and societies um, and providing them with PSS and, uh, and other, other, other skills related support, we will limit the impact that that recruitment um, has had on the child. So it becomes very close and enmeshed with response. Um, so there will be a lot of examples of, of these across. Uh, we'll talk about individual um, kind of areas of child protection, but if you can go to the next slide. Now, why is it critical for us to do primary prevention? We consider it an, we consider it an ethical responsibility for ourselves. And the reason for that is it's, it's not moral or ethical if you're able to, uh, to prevent harm to ha from happening to a child to not to do it. Sorry, that was a lot of double negatives there. Um, so basically, if you can prevent a child from being recruited in the, to begin with, if it's possible, because in some cases it may be out of, our, out of, our, out of the realm of possibility for us or for humanitarian actors, but in a lot of cases, it is possible and it becomes an ethical issue of not doing it and allowing or permitting that to happen before we intervene. Um, we also believe that it improves the sustainability of, our, of the impact of our programs, because once you start addressing root causes, you're, you're potentially having a much long, longer impact on, um, on the change that you're, you're going to see. Also, it's cost effective in the sense that if you address the root causes of child labor, at the same time, you are also addressing some of the root causes of, of uh, separation or recruitment into child labor, um, uh, sorry, armed forces and groups. Um, because the risk factors are often spread across multiple child protection harms. So it's much more cost effective for us to address root causes than, um, and also, both in the health sector where we borrow a lot of this and in child protection sector, um, the cost of the individual cost of, of taking a child through the case management process once the child has been harmed is significantly larger than trying to address the root causes before it happens. And it also leverages resources from other sectors. So the primary prevention framework um, takes us through basically the entire um, program management uh, cycle. Um, and this is borrowed from, from our minimum standards. You will see, we'll talk, it talks about needs assessment. It talks about design and planning. It talks about implementation monitoring, evaluating and learning, and then preparedness and the cycle continues. So you will find quite a bit of information on each of those steps and how primary prevention can be done at those steps. So it is very important to acknowledge that if you want to do prevention, we are not able to do it alone as child protection sector. A lot of risk factors and protective factors that we identify for child protection harm by nature are addressed through other sectors. For example, livelihood issues or, um, or food security issues that are in many cases as one of the, or, or one of the components of multiple risks that lead to many child protection harm, um, we are not gonna, as child protection actors, we are not going to establish a new livelihood program. We are going to reach out to livelihood colleagues and advocate for them to, to address that particular root cause. We'll reach out to education colleagues to, to address the root cause that links to education. And then there are some that we will be doing, for example, some of the um, family, uh, family strengthening work that, that we do or the work that we do at the community level. Um, 
all have linkages to uh, to prevention. Um, that's it from my side, I think, at this point. And I'll hand back over to Joanna, and I'll see you guys in a little bit again. Super. Thank you so much, Ani. Um, so just a couple of quick things uh, coming back. You probably have figured out um, whether your answer to those uh, two questions at the beginning of the webinar were correct. But based on what Hani has led us through, that question about reintegration of children associated with armed forces and armed groups would have been tertiary uh, prevention. And the one on social behavior norms would have been our primary prevention answer. So just making sure you have the answers to uh, those two questions. Um, and then um, building on what Hani's just uh, finished on the, the last point about strength and collaboration, I wanted to locate for us um, the uh, issues of prevention in our CPMS. So I think most of you know and may be using uh, on a fairly regular basis the child protection minimum standards. Um, when we revised it and, and launched it in 2019, there was an icon that we started to use in the text itself, and that's the icon on the screen. That's our prevention icon. So um, you will see it down the side. I can see it right here. I am on standard one. So around coordination, um, 1.1.9, around developing a community mobilization strategy that includes child-friendly messages on child protection risks. So we don't differentiate between the level of prevention by using this icon, but it does give you some pointers or some reminders about using that prevention lens as you look at particular activities um, and, and as you're using the minimum standards themselves. So on that note, I will pass the floor over to uh, our first um, example, so to speak. Uh, I think it's Sarah Oppard who's going to be talking to us about um, uh, unaccompanied and separated children and the prevention of family separation. Over to you, Sarah. Um, actually, Marley's going to give the presentation, so I'll hand over to Marley. <laughs> Sorry, I was... fine. I had to unmute myself. Apologies. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Marlene uh, Cortos Altus, and I have been uh, working together uh, with my colleague uh, Sarah Appert, who you just uh, saw for a few seconds. Um, and we uh, have been working on a consultancy to uh, revise uh, the current uh, Unaccompanied and Separated Children Handbook and the TOT that relates to family separation and unaccompanied and ch uh, separated children programming in order to amend like, um, uh, the content and uh, make sure it was like adapted to the primary prevention framework. And then specifically, obviously, how it relates to the prevention of uh, family separation and uh, preserving uh, family unity. And of course, I mean, we all know that like when it comes to uh, family uh, separation, it is extremely important that we uh, capitalize all our efforts uh, on uh, prevention uh, work. And uh, we see also specifically that there is a lot of scope uh, to enhance uh, primary prevention uh, interventions. And so we will look at that now. Maybe you can go to the next slide, even the next next slide. <laughs> so just to explain, um, I think also Hani, of course, went already into the details just in, in general about the different levels. But when it comes to uh, unaccompanied and separated children, um, um, Primary prevention addresses the root causes again among uh, the entire population or uh, specific subgroups in the population, as Hani explained, to reduce the likelihood and incidence of family separation. So in general, these are all children in the community, but it could also be, for example, children in a subgroup. And then, for example, we could specifically think of like groups of internally displaced uh, persons or uh, refugees. Uh, etc. Then when it comes to secondary uh, prevention, uh, this addresses like the specific threats and uh, vulnerabilities of children identified as being at risk of family separation. Um, and tertiary prevention, again, as also Hani explained, it's actually uh, uh, looking at children who have the harm has already done. So that means in this case, those children that have already been uh, separated from their families uh, and how yeah, it aims to like, mitigate the longer impact. 
And um, as we've also seen during the previous presentation, uh, and we know from our experience, like once children are actually uh, unaccompanied or separated, they're often exposed to a, a variety of risks. Um, and that could be, for example, uh, child labor or uh, trafficking recruit recruitment into armed groups, uh, child uh, marriage, all, all types of uh, um, uh, issues uh, that uh, these are the different types of issues that children at risk uh, 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 that are separated can face. And um, of course, I mean, it, it, it's extremely important if we think about the devastating impact of family separation to, to, to put all our efforts uh, to prevent uh, this from happening. And then again, also, as Hani was explaining, this is uh, not just uh, at the level of child protection, but it's like across, uh, it will be on interventions across all sectors. Um, and again, in order to really understand how we uh, should uh, um, address like um, and uh, put in place primary prevention uh, interventions, we really need to, need to look at the root causes in a specific population uh, that lead to family separation. Next slide, please. <laughs> so again, as I said, we need to understand and analyze uh, the root causes of family separation and understand the associated risk, of which I just mentioned a couple of examples. Uh, and this really depends on the, uh, um, on the context. And of course, it can relate to, for example, sudden movements of uh, the population, but often it's also related to more long-term, deeply rooted uh, root causes such as like uh, um, socioeconomic vulnerability uh, and so on. And then again, also in order to really support this, we need to understand also what are the protective factors at the different levels that actually prevent um, uh, family uh, separation and preserve uh, family unity within a given context. And the overall goal, of course, of primary prevention of family separation, this is very important, is to reduce the number of families and children that are in need of secondary or tertiary prevention response services. And this are, these are, for example, case management and family tracing and reunification. And again, to uh, also underline some of the points that have been made before, apart from that we have a moral obligation to do this, given the devastating impact, this will also be um, uh, cost-effective uh, in terms of child protection uh, services. Now, uh, just to give you a few uh, uh, examples of primary prevention interventions, as I've said before, it of course depends on the root causes in the first place, uh, and these are just some examples. But one is, um, for example, investment into the national care system to make sure that there are um, a variety of appropriate uh, community and family-based alternative care uh, options uh, or um, solutions available. And um, also promoting quality standards and monitoring of all care arrangements, uh, registration of displaced persons um, and populations, um, including caregivers and their children at border crossings. Um, and then, uh, of course, like has been mentioned before, this also applies to prevention of family separation, provision of social protection programs and socioeconomic support. So mainly like cash uh, transfer schemes, and it can be coupled with like family strengthening interventions. Uh, so to avoid like family breakdown and to uh, support uh, pres uh, to preserve uh, family uh, unity. And also uh, other than that, for example, gatekeeping measures at the national level um, um, to uh, try to limit uh, uh, and put all measures in place to uh, limit uh, or prevent actually the placement of children in residential care and only use that as a last resort. Um, yes, and then, uh, for example, also at the secondary and uh, tertiary uh, level, just to 
uh, mentioned some interventions. These could also, for example, be like uh, family support and uh, at the tertiary level mainly is like, as I said before, like uh, case management and uh, um, um, family tracing and reunification services. So that is it from our side. Thank you so much, Marlene. Um, we will move on then to our next presentation, which is from Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, if you want to come on and, and tell us a little bit about primary prevention and child labor. Thank you very much, Fiona, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvia Oñate, and I'm actually the co-lead of the Child Labor Task Force, the Global Child Labor Task Force. I'm going to present briefly um, on prevention of child labor at the primary level. So you can maybe move to the next slide. I want to start by saying that prevention and response are like two approaches that complement one another in a comprehensive child labor program. And that prevention actually refers to the actions that are aimed at preventing child labor, uh, children sorry, from entering child labor. So when we speak about like primary level, it's about addressing the root causes among the population, the community, the target group where we're working to reduce that likelihood of child labor. And prevention can take place in both preparedness, but also in response phases of the humanitarian action. So what it means in, in summary is about reducing the risk factors as well as promoting the protective factors. And uh, in humanitarian, when we speak about prevention actions, we prioritize also forms of child labor, including worse forms of child labor that are likely to emerge or worsen as a direct result of a, of a humanitarian crisis. So I'm going to briefly present on like key actions um, to you as practitioners uh, working in, you know, in child protection programming or like child labor programming and practical tools that can be used and some key actions. So first important key action uh, in line with the primary prevention framework is about understanding uh, the root causes of harm to children and protective factors that mitigate harm within the context. So that's the, pri you know, that's the primary prevention efforts and the foundation. So as you see in the, in the screen, we have to look at the risk and protective factors at the different socio-ecological levels. So both risk and protective factors can be found at the individual, at family, community, and society. Uh, and for example, in child labor, some of the examples in terms of risk or protective factors could be at individual level, uh, children and uh, not having birth registration or a protective factor can be the legal status or like the documentation uh, available. Um, or another, like for example, like risk factor could be family members uh, having, you know, performing exploitative work. Uh, or family members actually like valuing and supporting investing in education. So um, I want to highlight that we have a very practical tool that is called child labor risks and protective factors that we, will, we can share in the chat, present the common risk and protective factors in humanitarian settings. And it's important to identify these risk and protective factors actually in a, this specific context to better understand those factors. So the key is about understanding the context, but this tool actually gives you um, a long list about potential risks and factors and see how you can adapt and how you can apply it to your context. For example, imagine like in some situations being young, can be a very risk factor uh, where young children actually are like, you know, in agriculture, child labor alongside the family, but in other situation can be a protective factor in a setting that is more like adolescents that they start working to provide income for family. Uh, so again, I want to like, you know, point you to these two uh, to highlight the action about understanding risk and protective factors. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, once that we have identified risk and protective factors across the socio-ecological uh, level, um, it's also important to collaborate with a range group of agencies and groups to address these risk and protective factors, of course. Uh, we know that not a single project can actually cover all levels. So another uh, key action that I wanted to highlight today in line also with the primary prevention framework 
is to use a holistic uh, multi-sectoral approach. Um, we know that while like child labor actually fits within the child protection programming, not only like child protection actors alone can actually prevent child labor. So it's very important the involvement of multiple sectors for effective prevention of child labor. Um, here in the diagram in the screen on the slide, you can see uh, it's the prevention and response uh, multi-sectoral uh, programmatic framework for addressing child labor in a variety of humanitarian contexts. And it actually covers a specific like action for prevention across different sectors. Um, across different levels of the socio-ecological model. Um, something to also highlight is if I have to like point to one of the most important prevention priorities, I could highlight um, humanitarian action should never lead to child labor. So again, I want to refer to the tool that is called preventing child labor risks related to humanitarian action that can also be accessible in the microsite and in the toolkit of the child labor toolkit, which has actually uh, provides like potential child labor risks, but also mitigation measures for the different sectors. So one example could be the children uh, below the legal age for work participate, for example, in a cash for work uh, offer or created by food security and livelihood colleagues. And the mitigation uh, strategy would be provide awareness and conduct also age verification during the registration and program implementation. So uh, besides risk fight humanitarian uh, action, there's also a specific example for rapid prevention actions uh, within the multi-sectoral approach that you can find in the toolkit. And, uh, the last action, if you go to the next slide, that I also want to highlight, and again, um, in line with the primary prevention framework, is that to prevent child labor, it's very important to bridge development and humanitarian systems. So it's very important to work where possible with development actors and government structures and the local authorities responsible for the child welfare. Uh, to invest as well uh, in preparedness between like non-humanitarian and humanitarian actors and to strengthen uh, the prevention within the child protection systems and includes, for example, on how to adapt during the times of, of crisis, identifying risks and protective factors. And key areas to, to highlight and consider is around coordination, so again, identifying what are these national bodies, government authorities, and facilitate that uh, participation of different actors in the coordination mechanism. Um, and then also around like capacity strengthening. So ensure at a minimum, all the like, key actors are aware uh, about the priorities, level concerns that can prioritize capacity building guidance, uh, for example, understanding what are like some of the signs of child labor, some of the minimum understanding about the legal framework, etc. So again, uh, for practical tools, I wanted to highlight there's a coordinator checklist, but also we have a learning package on child labor that can be also used for development actors, for government actors. Uh, and there's a tool that uh, points to like different signs of child labor that is uh, usually used and adapted for different awareness sessions and capacity building sessions. Um, and finally, I want to move to the, an example, if you go to the next slide which uh, we also have in our toolkit different case studies. So uh, I know like, you know, most of you probably have put this into practice. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight an example from Jordan, from our colleagues in Jordan, that actually uh, developed some standard operating procedures to prevent child labor in Satori camp. And the case study actually describes how to ensure safe access to relief items for all the families and to protect children from child labor. And they actually, the SOPs highlight following procedures, like having a specific like service booth for screening, uh, alternative collector schemes, community uh, mitigation steps, like you know, increasing awareness, community awareness raising around, like you know, prior to the distributions, etc. 
Um, so that's like an example of how uh, prevention to the target population in such a camp uh, on, on child labor. And to end my presentation, I want to go to the next slide about resources and to promote um, that you can go to the child labor microsite where you can find the interagency toolkit uh, that has strong component on prevention, on child labor and humanitarian action, and has different practical tools, case studies, uh, and also learning resources um, for preventing child labor at primary, but also like at secondary tertiary levels. And again, I want to highlight that the Child Labor Task Force uh, is here to support, and we will also provide the details in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, I'm actually going to pause the flow of the uh, agenda and come back to a number of questions that have been percolating around, in particular around livelihoods and cash for work, and whether or not this can be seen as primary prevention, whether it be for separation, whether it be for child labor, and so on. So I don't know if one of our panelists so far want to talk about um, the use of livelihood support as primary prevention. Happy to come in if helpful. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, livelihood, if, if livelihood issues are identified as one of the risk factors of separation or child labor or other child protection harm, then livelihood inter interventions can become a, a primary prevention also because oftentimes livelihood interventions are done at large scale at, at population level. So once you once you target and you make sure that you're you're doing it to address risk a particular risk at a subpopulation level, then the answer is yes. Yeah, maybe I can just add something also how it relates to family separation, um, because uh, again also um, like depending on the root causes of family separation that have been identified. Oftentimes, actually, children are separated from their families, uh, be, yeah, as a, as a coping mechanism, um, because, for example, families are struggling to uh, support uh, and um, provide support for their children in due to, for example, uh, social economic vulnerability, uh, and we have a variety of uh, of of reasons and root causes. And then we also see that um, uh, livelihood support and uh, cash transfers can be really like a, a good measure at the primary level, uh, population level, um, to prevent uh, family separation and to preserve uh, family unity. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, Marlene. <laughs> Thanks, Marlene, and thank you, Hani, for, for those uh, interesting examples and, and approaches to how we would use those kind of interventions. Um, I'm going to pass the floor now over to Paula Vargas, who I introduced at the beginning, is a child protection specialist with UNICEF in Timor-Leste, to talk about how the primary prevention framework was used in that country in a recent emergency. Paula? Yes, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. And good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present the experience of Timor-Leste in de developing the community-based uh, mental health and psychosocial intervention as an example of primary prevention. Next, please. So a little bit of context. Uh, in the April 2021, Timor-Leste had to face the Seroja cyclone flooding emergency, affecting more than 40,000 5,000 people. And in response of this emergency, UNICEF and the Ministry of Social Solidarity developed a mental health and psychosocial intervention for affected children and their families. Uh, so from April to May in uh, 2021, 13 child-friendly spaces were implemented in the evacuation camps uh, in collaboration with NGOs and youth uh, groups or organizations. Next, please. As part of the like uh, prim primary uh, prevention um, framework, uh, we did uh, uh, we did the risk and protective um, assessment 
um, identifying some um, some protective factors and some risk factors that are, that the families are going to uh, um, are going to face when the uh, emergency. Um, as the response of the emergency finalized, and they have to come back to their uh, to their fam to their families, no, um, and to their communities. Sorry, so to their communities. So then, after after the flood emergency, as was I was saying, and after just analyzing the next list, after analyzing the risk and protective factors that we know that during the emergency are elevating the risk of violence um, against children and um, domestic violence. Um, as uh, UNICEF, we identified that the, the mental health activities needed to continue, needed to, to continue to help to activate and respond, restore the natural support within the community and the families, aiming to prevent domestic violence and violence against children and neglect, abuse and neglect. So this transition that we call transitioning from the emergency to the community-based uh, mental health, it was a, a, um, a learning experience in building this community-based mental health and psychosocial support uh, program to effectively restore and strengthen and mobilize families and community system and services with the goal of supporting children and families' well-being. We, uh, um, we engage uh, volunteers and the group of the communities in providing children with opportunities to access to structured play, recreation, in a way that strengthens their resilience and existing protective factors. Also, we include sessions for parents so that they understand better their children's emotional needs and increase their ability to talk about challenges, change gender norms and seek for help. It also provides parents with positive coping skills to care for their own mental health. Furthermore, the program provides trained to the social service workforce and volunteer in psychosocial first aid, so they become better equipped to provide psychosocial support for children and families. Finally, the program also strengthened the referral mechanism in cases children and their families need a specific uh, support. So as part of the implementation and monitoring, one of the first uh, action that we made uh, is to strengthen the coordination mechanism along with, uh, with other partners, including them in the assessment, the planning and the implementation phases. So we have like 13 NGOs, government and partners and youth groups uh, working together. So uh, in uh, one of our key activities is the capacity building among the uh, volunteers and among the community. So with the particip participation of the, of the community leaders, First of all, we identify the volunteers and train them in weekly basis. Then we de develop and contextualize a tool and a guidelines to support the volunteers' work and delivery the activities with parents and children. The volunteers, the idea is that the volunteers will be holding knowledge and skill to transmit to other volunteers and continue to support the community. <clears throat> the structure of how we deliver, uh, next please. The, stru the structure of how um, we deliver the activities and how we support and monitor the implementation of the activities is very imp important. We created a structure where the volunteers who are the community members are the ones who have direct contact with the communities and are the ones delivering the activity with the children and families. Then the volunteers choose a team leader who is going to have a specific role in supporting and coordinating the activities, gathering the information and monitoring. We establish one coordinator per community who is selected from all the volunteers and he is responsible to coordinate and monitor the activities within all the community and responsible to the needs assessment analysis planning with the community members. In addition, the supervision is responsible or responsibility of the government and the CSOs 
who supervise the work in all the communities and they are responsible to strengthen the referral mechanism and the capacity building uh, and training. Next, please. So what kind of activities we do with children? We do psychosocial activities uh, with tools like breathing, grounding, and expressing uh, art, dance, songs, and storytelling, daily general structure and free play that can be natural, promote and learning growth and uh, uh, facilitate the development of essential competencies and healthy, not competency uh, sport to support children confidence. The activities help to express and understand children and families feeling and how to cope with a difficult situation, learn, learning to be thankful and also feel safe. Also, uh, next please. Also, we include the families and caregivers in the program to integrate and support children through their, uh, uh, through their families, explaining to the families how best support the children and how to cope with the stress. And uh, fam uh, fi finally, we, we learn and we understand that there will, uh, there, there will be many times when the work that the community and the volunteers are doing is not enough. And then we need, uh, uh, and the children, we need a specific uh, support and a specific access to services. Therefore, um, we uh, strengthen a coordination uh, mechanism and referral pathway to uh, support the, the, uh, the, the volunteers that, uh, and, and when uh, a case like this happened. And also we ensure that the volunteers regular needs assessment and follow up and, and review these, uh, the findings so to identify uh, cases at risk. So in conclusion, the community based mental psychosocial support is an intervention to effectively restore, strengthen, and mobilize families and community systems and service, providing children and their families with opportunities to strengthen their resilience and existing protective factors and preventing violence against children and, uh, and uh, domestic violence. So thank you. Thank you for, for your attention. That's, that's our experience here. Thank you so much, Paula, for pulling it together and sharing with us what you're doing and how you use the, the framework in order to identify some of the concerns and figure out what some of the measures could be um, to strengthen mental health and psychosocial support in, in particular for the children in Timor-Leste. So, you know, good strength to you as you continue on that specific work. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box, but because we're coming to the top of the hour, we did want to um, have one last uh, intervention, which is on deciding um, on what to prioritize for your programming when you look at primary prevention. Hani, do you want to take us through the slide itself, the, the tool? Sure. Maybe I'll just, if I can share my, okay, I'll just go through this because of lack of time. <laughs> um, I, I had a little exercise that I wanted to do with you guys, but because we don't have time, I'll just go into this. So this is pretty key in terms of how we change the way we normally program in child protection, which is oftentimes linked to sub areas of child protection. So we program for unaccompanied and separated children, we program for child labor. Um, whereas when we start thinking about programming preventatively, then our lens has to shift and think about risk factors and protective factors being the entry point. And what, what I mean by that is, this is just an example. I, I picked child labor and separation because that's what we discussed here. So let's imagine we have done an exercise. We have identify, identified a number of risk factors and, and protective factors for child labor and separation. Um, there is a tool. Uh, it's actually in Annex 4 of the framework. So if you go to the, to the framework and go to Annex 4, um, of the framework, maybe one of my colleagues can copy paste the link in the chat. Um, it gives you a tool that allows you to say, okay, access to secondary education is a risk factor for child labor. Now, if we address access to secondary education, is it going to be high impact in terms of preventing child labor or is it gonna be low impact? If it's high impact, it will go high on the on the um, y axis, right? So it will be it will be put pretty high on the impact line. 
Now, we also think about how feasible is it, it is to address access to secondary education. Is child protection, uh, sorry, is the education uh, sector is strong in that particular context? Can we work with them to, to increase access? If the answer is yes, so you, you put it towards the right side of the, of the graph, we're on the feasibility line. So you say it's feasible and it's high impact. So it ends up in that right-hand quadrant at the top. Um, you can do the same exercise for every risk and protective factors. And then you end up with a diagram like this. Now we want to probably address all of the things that end up in that right up, upper hand quadrant. So here we have access to secondary education for child labor and for education, which means if you address access to secondary education, you're supporting prevention of child labor and separation. You also see that knowledge on risk of separation and knowledge of on risk of child labor sits pretty high on impact and on feasibility. Um, and it's relevant to both child labor and separation. So that's how you end up uh, prioritizing programming for, for prevention rather than, because we always have limitations in terms of funds, we can't address every single risk factor. Uh, we are at time, but this is an ex extremely important part of the shift in mentality. And I encourage you guys to look at Annex 4 of the framework to understand better how this tool works, which will then help you program in the field in the field preventatively. Back to you, John. Lovely. Thanks so much, Hani. And, and sorry that we had to squash this and not do the exercise, because I think it is, as you say, a, a good way to start to understand that shift. Uh, as so long we've been trying to work against silos. Um, and this is one way that we can really look at um, look at working across the different approaches that we need to better improve uh, for the protection of children at different levels. Um, lots of these tools, as we have been showing in the chat box, are available, different kinds of resources. And we did just want to summarize um, some of them. These are existing resources, that primary prevention framework that we mentioned and shared a link to, um, the report and evidence brief, a tool for identifying ranking risk and protective factors, et cetera. Um, these are available on the Alliances, the Global Alliances website, so cpha.org, um, and if you go to the Prevention Initiative. Um, soon there will be a, a piece about uh, children with disabilities, which is an interesting and necessary complement to the work we've done so far. There is one prevention video that's available on the Alliance's YouTube channel, and there's a couple more coming. So if you're presenting to others or trying to kind of clarify or get some visuals for, um, for the work about prevention, particularly at the primary level, then um, do use and look out for these um, upcoming uh, videos. There will be some more learning opportunities. So if you've liked what you've learned from this webinar and want to go a bit further, or if you're wanting to be training others, um, there are a few tools already available, but there will be some others that will be forthcoming over the next uh, few months. Um, and if you don't know about our community of practice, or if you're already a member of the community of practice, um, there will be more engagement around the topic of prevention. I think there already is some um, in different ways on that platform, but there's going to be a stronger emphasis and a chance to explore your examples and your challenges and so on. Um, as you may have seen, which is maybe why you came to uh, this webinar, um, we have a number of uh, messages out on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, etc. Um, if you like them, please forward them, use them, screen grab them, whatever you want to do, um, in order to continue to have this message about prevention and the central role that it plays in protecting children, um, you know, out amongst our child protection colleagues in less humanitarian settings, in humanitarian settings, and other humanitarian actors beyond just child protection, et cetera. Because I think we have some really clear messaging um, and images that are striking, et cetera, that um, may help us move this agenda forward. Finally, just a quick thank you. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll try and follow up with you individually. Um, thank you to all of the panelists, uh, to Hani, to Sylvia, to Marlene, uh, to Paula, um, or presenting. Um, and if you want to be in touch uh, and need any support or have any questions or have any suggestions or want to share what you're doing so we can uh, expand the pool of knowledge around uh, prevention, then please email us either at prevention at alliancecpha.org or at cpms.wg at alliancecpha.org as well. So big thank you again for your time. Um, stay tuned. 
um, either on social media or by going to the Alliance's website for more information and more resources. And please reach out for any support you need, or as I said, any exchanges you want to have between us and, uh, and yourselves. Thanks everyone, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.